All right, so call the uh, media center elementary school committee uh, to order at uh, six o'clock on uh, January 12th, 2021. All right. Um, and again, Peter, thank you for the, the minutes. Can we get a, a motion to uh, approve? I move to approve the minutes as presented. Outstanding. Second? All seconds. Okay, any discussion? All right, uh, let's see. Peter? Yes. Daisy? Yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. Minutes approved. All right. And uh, let's see. On the agenda, we have a uh, financial statement and uh, sign warrants first. Do we um, so go into like. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll do the budget proposal after. Yeah, I'll just talk about FY21 right now, and then we'll come back to 22. Okay. Um, so I just sent you all an email in case you haven't checked your email. I did some updating today. We'll talk about more of that when we get to FY22. But I also updated the monthly financial report. Um, Peter had sent some questions after my report went out. So I wanted to make sure that I tried to address some of those. Um, but the first order of business here is the five warrants uh, you all signed electronically and reviewed, totaling $36,501.83. Um, and then I did send you the school choice and the general fund expense reports through December 31st. So I'm happy to take questions about those if you have them. Um, and then just a note here on COVID expenses. Um, we've requested reimbursement from the town of around $21,000. Uh, we've also asked them to pay vendors directly about another $11,000 in COVID expenses. And then we're still waiting for some technology orders, Chromebooks in particular, um, which when those come in, the towns will pay roughly $41,000 more directly to the vendors for us. So just a little update on that. I know we've been talking about what those expenses are. Um, reimbursements will go back primarily to the school choice fund, but there were some things paid out of the general fund that we'll be looking to move back, but mostly school choice. Um, any questions at this point before I keep going? Okay. Um, so I had given you a school lunch snapshot and with Peter's question that came in about what the revolving fund looks like and sort of, um, I felt like you needed more information at this point about what's happening in the count and maybe a little bit of a history as a reminder. Um, so currently we're looking at a year to date net income of a negative $9,500 in the school lunch account. That is because we are, all students, I'm sorry, are receiving free breakfast or free lunch if they want them. And the government reimbursement on that, whether it's state or federal, is minimal. Um, so this sort of leads into a little bit for next year, which I'm not going to get into in great detail. But the reason this conversation was brought up in greater detail for with Peter's question is, you know, we're talking about shifting some wages. And that may be something that we actually have to consider for this year as well for school lunch. Um, but again, wanted to give you some history here. So in 2019 or fiscal year 19, uh, the school lunch program gener generated 122,000 in revenue and only had 96,000 in expenditures. So clearly the program was funding itself and then able to put a little bit away into surplus, which actually helped us last year um, because I believe, Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we had to replace the fridge or walk-in freezer, something like that. And we used $10,000 from that fund. So that's the exact purpose of trying to make a little bit of money in our school lunch program um, so that when we do have these unforeseen expenditures, we have some funds available. Um, so when we went into FY20, we were in a pretty good shape. Um, we had a, a decent balance there. Um, but our revenue was significantly reduced. So if we had been on projection of the same as the prior year, which there was no reason not to be, we should have been bringing in around that 120,000 in revenue, but we dropped down to 78,000 with the school closures and school being remote. Um, and the, the difficult part here is, you know, we made um, a decision in the best interest of our staff and continue to pay wages, even though we knew that we were not bringing in enough revenue, um, but that did have a negative impact on us. So while revenue dropped significantly, our expenditures only dropped a little bit. 
Um, so we ended last year with only about $21,000 in our surplus account. We should have had maybe around double that would be my projection. Um, so then we, we fast forward a little bit to this year and revenue right now is pretty much non-existent other than that government reimbursement, which is for breakfast, $2.89 per meal and for lunch, $3.59. So when we're talking about this year's numbers, if you look at that snapshot that I gave you all, we are covering food costs and supply costs. Um, if we look at our revenue of, of about 11,000, those expenditures are around 10,000. Um, but where the challenge comes in is our wages, which are paid from this account. Um, so we really are at this point depleting any savings that we have and you know considering the projections and what I know right now of our revenue and expenditures I think we're actually going to have a loss this year um, not just net income but our our balance at the end of the year is going to be negative five to ten thousand that we are going to have to supplement from another source um, so we're going to talk more about this when we get to 22, but that's the real numbers right now for 21. Um, and I don't want to get too far ahead, but I am happy to take questions about this year's program or anything that happened or impacted last year, if you do have them. Uh, Greg, if, if I may, um, so the, we're getting an actual reimbursement per meal, not just based on the supplies that we're buying. Correct. Um, I saw something some point in the fall where I think Ben was sending out a letter to parents basically saying that the kids ought to bring their own lunches because of COVID concerns, which, you know, seemed totally reasonable and so on, um, which would also mean that we wouldn't be selling many lunches. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, is is that still the situation or um, we, we are we happily providing lunches now? I, I don't recall saying that. Maybe Peter. I maybe I misremember. Yeah. I, I, you know, if if I did, I'm sorry. Um, and, and it struck me as a reasonable thing to say. It just struck me that boy, that makes it even harder for the school lunch program to, I, to I, generate I, much revenue. I know, I know one of the things I mentioned is that we were asking parents if they were sending their students to school with food, to send them in, send it in with containers that the students could access themselves. Um, but I'm not sure if there was any distinction between whether they should bring their own meal or take advantage of the school meal. Okay. It is possible, Peter, that you're not losing your mind. I possibly could have said such a, you know, that we had concerns about what the lunch program will look like next year, even the fact that more students may bring their foods that could have came up as well, not knowing what the factors were going forward. So I don't think you're, I don't think you're losing it in the sense of, you know, somebody could have said something on that and on that regards to, we didn't know what the lunch program was going to do. Yeah. Then, you know, then the government continued the free lunch program. Um, I mean, did, Darius, do you get a sense in, or, or you or Shelly or Ben and talking to other schools? I mean, I'm assuming they're all in the same boat or um, have, have they just laid off staff or, you know, or are they just sort of dealing with it the same way? I just didn't know what sort of sense you get from from talking around. It's a little bit of both. Um, some schools get, have a greater um, amount of students on free and reduced lunch, so they're actually, therefore they're getting even more money. And so you are, you know, the, the problem we have is the number of lunches. You know, Shelly, you can probably give me more detail on that. But the number of lunches we serve versus the cost in order to produce those lunches. You know, the more lunch if you're a larger school, you know, your you start to your your margins start to change because of you know, what it takes to have a person you know serve, right, prepare that kind of stuff. Um, I, I do want to go back. You know, we did pay the the our our employees in this in the spring when we were shut down. I want people to know it wasn't you know the idea that if we could we paid them or the town could have paid them through unemployment. You know what I mean? So it's like you know so when you're talking about if you're a taxpayer watching, it's like you could you're shifting the where the money's coming from on that particular thing. And so you know we decided that not knowing the full length of it, you know, in hindsight would we have done something different on that? Perhaps you know hindsight's easy on a lot of things, but. Um, at the time, it was the, you know, we could just shift the cost off to the town, you know, flood the towns where they may have budgeted there, where we had the budget to carry it through. So I just want to say that out because that's an important factor. Um, well, I also think another consideration is that town-wide, I mean, school and all the various town departments, there has been a uh, concerted effort throughout this whole COVID process to 
uh, you know, continue to pay employees. And that's been true in, in, the, other, in the various town departments. Um, and, you know, one is, you know, just you could say a dollar and cents thing about, well, if you either pay them or else you end up paying it through unemployment. But it's also, you know, we got long term relationships with our employees. And so it's important that you treat them as well as you possibly can. And so, you know, I'm not I'm not object out. I, I don't want to be misunderstood to think I'm objecting to doing this. I think we're doing the right thing. It just boy, it's hard. And I look around and I so I just sort of wonder, you know, are we are other schools something, doing something that we could you know, maybe go along the same line that would help us, but still, you know, we got to keep this, we got relationships with the employees that, that we need to maintain and we, and we need to treat them properly. And so um, this may just be the way it is. So what I know of a couple of other districts in our area from my um, business managers group that I belong to, um, I think we're probably one of the very few schools that have been so, so much in person, even though we're hybrid, but a lot of the other schools are fully remote. And so their lunch programs don't look the same as ours. So they have reduced staff um, in a much more significant way than we have. Right now, our school lunch staff are getting their hours cut. Um, and it is unfortunate, but we don't have any other choice. And this is district wide across all five schools. And they're the only group that's impacted actually right now. Um, when we are remote, they're only coming in on days that we're serving lunches um, for pickup or if they're doing delivery. And um, there are even people who are not working their full hours when we're in hybrid because there's not enough kids in the building. So that may shift some with the phase three rollout of kids coming back into the buildings. But we've actually seen some savings in our wages. That number of deficit would be much higher if we had everybody in at their normal rate. So. Um, you know, I think we're doing what we can right now, and I think every district is unique. Um, I know that there's another district that's paying, they're locked into their bus contract, didn't see any major savings there, so they're paying to deliver meals with the buses on their bus contract. So everybody's doing something a little bit different, I think, right now, and impacted in different ways. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't meaning to be critical. I just felt like, gee, this is like, it just boggles my mind that, you know, somehow we could, you know, have gone from something that I thought we, you know, obviously pre COVID we had, you know, we had a good thing working in terms of, of, of a balance of the finances and, and uh, it's just been blown out of the water, but I guess, you know, we got to deal with it. So. And I think you're asking good questions, Peter. I don't think you're being overly critical or taking back any decisions that we've made, at least not from my perspective. And I think we have to talk about this. And, you know, we have been talking about it since May, but there's also been every single month there's there's changes that, you know, we're not even thinking of in this moment while we're meeting. So I appreciate the questions there. I mean, that I listened last night. Select board was getting the budget presentation from the library committee. And, and the library director and you know they've been doing a whole lot of things way differently you know that that i mean they're still providing services but boy the model is way different than it was a year ago and um you know that's what we all got to do is we got to come up with new ways of doing things and and uh sometimes financially they they you know there are burdens but we just got to deal with it so we're going to talk more about school lunch when we get into the FY22 budget. Um, but I also did want to point out that I added some um, updates and projections on the report that I sent you for our other revolving funds, because I think that those are important uh, to pay attention to as well. And I haven't given you a written update like this on these accounts in some months. So I thought it was a good idea to put here, given Peter's questions. Thank you. Um, so you're welcome. So school choice, uh, what we're looking at right now, and we had already talked about this, I think, in December, that our numbers are slightly down. Um, Karen, Ben, and I did talk again today about what the school choice numbers look like, especially for those pertaining to special education students. And I do think we have an opportunity to bring that number up a little bit um, based on what we looked at for reports. Uh, but the numbers that I included in my financial report are based on the actual enrollment that DESE has, um, which is different than what it was June 30th. They always update on October 1. 
Um, and then, you know, just as a reminder from last year, uh, we did have a significant increase in our start of year balance because we froze the budget last year and we were able to reallocate and shift some funds around. So we are in a better position going into this year than we would have been um, because of those changes. And then to present level funding uh, for this year, we also agreed to overexpend the revenue coming in. Um, so with all of that said, my projection right now for uh, the end of this fiscal year as we start talking about the 22 budget is just shy of 240000 in the um, school choice revolving fund, which if we go back to the 2019 year I looked at again today, we had around 90000 when we were back in 2019. So we're certainly going in the right direction. Um, and again, we're going to talk about this more, but school choice will likely take another hit with 22 um, budget building. And then also gave you the early childhood revolving update and the special education revolving update. There's not a whole lot of change to those since I gave you the original numbers at the beginning of the year, pretty straightforward. Um, we are looking, uh, projecting right now at the end of this year going into 22 for early childhood, having around 20,000 remaining as a rollover and almost the same number for the special education revolving fund. Um, so that's an update on where we stand with revolving accounts for 21. I don't have anything else for this current year uh, right now. Uh, if no one else has anything else, uh, on to uh, public comment. Uh, let's see. Uh, I know we have a written statement. Um, uh, Ms. Sada Polin, like, you would like to make a statement? I would. Thank Please you, do. Gregory. Um, so tonight, uh, I'm a special ed teacher uh, at Sunderland, and tonight I wanted to thank you school committee members for the job you are doing as elected officials. I wanted to share my gratitude for you listening to those of us on the front lines, heeding the numbers and uh, representing our town, as well as making very difficult decisions for the health and wellness of our school community in the midst of this global health crisis. The frightening events of last Wednesday at the Capitol make it clear how important it is that we recognize our common purpose and humanity, and in spite of our differences, work respectfully together. And I just wanted to thank you for the important democratic work you do in supporting the well being of the students and the staff at SES. We appreciate you and we are grateful. Well, thank you. And, uh... You know, much appreciated back and obviously of course uh we appreciate uh what you guys do as as well uh the staff uh the other public comment was written by cpac and it's uh on somewhat similar lines uh if i may read the frsu 38 cpac would like to thank the members of this committee for their ongoing support of special education students we hope that we will continue to give special education and other vulnerable learners uh, the option to access in-person instruction, regardless of what model is used uh, for the rest of the school community. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, uh, from, let's see, Holly Johnson, uh, Asia Cerrone, Carrie Thurlow, and uh, Crystal Brown. And, and of course, I mean, I feel like we got to pass these thanks back to the, uh, the teachers and the, and the staff for, understanding that we can mitigate risk at the same time uh we uh we deal with our most vulnerable learners and, and try to you know find a good balance between giving the services that are safe to give uh while at the same time uh taking reasonable precautions all right uh anyone else anything Okay, in that case, uh, on to unfinished business, the anti-racism, equity, and uh, uh, update or committee update. 
So um, I reached out to them. They haven't had a lot of contact points for, uh, since the uh, since the break, and so they uh, are. Want, I want to keep it on the agenda, but the uh, they're not. They don't. They don't report this evening. Um, I'm, I'm sure they probably could have turned around after last week's um, uh, last week's incident at the you know the Capitol. I'm sure they they'd love to kind of make sure that their presence are still known. But um, we kind of planned out that this month they they didn't have a report for today. Um, and they, they are, there is work that's happening, especially a lot of student work that's happening this month, and they're going to be reporting that um, next month. Outstanding. All right, in that case, uh, COVID-19 update. So um, just kind of overall, um, a, couple of, a couple of things that are, um, what's up, obviously we're, we're back in, in, in uh, the hybrid model now. Um, it's interesting that this COVID update changes from week to week, even though my meetings, um, as my meetings change. Um, a couple um, small kind of thing. We do have antigen testing. It's up and running. We've actually been using it on students who've gone to the nurse's office and, and have been dismissed. And so, you know, fortunately, there's been no positive cases so far. But, um, you know, we have dismissed, um, I think, maybe close to a half a dozen students who we gave the antigen test to. So knowing that they're leaving with either a fever or not feeling well and, um, and screening them on the way out. Um, I also want to know, this is kind of hot off the press. I don't have a whole lot of prepared for it, but I, I attended a meeting with the state today regarding the rollout of pool testing. Um, the idea, so this is kind of really hot off the press, so to speak. I mean, I'm sure Des has to do some push out, but basically what they're going to put, push out to schools is a free six-week trial on, you know, pool testing. What pool testing is, is, you know, basically taking your cohorts within your building and doing one test on the whole cohort. And if that cohort comes back positive, then you do you do more testing to that. You can start with antigen testing to see if you can find out who in that group um, you know, is positive. The great news on this is that it really becomes school-wide testing. Um, and the way they're doing it is you know, um, a more efficient way, um, cost-effective way. Um, there are three schools in Eastern Mass that have um, rolled this out. Um, I had actually was looking into it you know, weeks ago and it just was cost, so cost-prohibitive. Um, unless you use all your CARES money in, in the town of Salem, <clears throat> you know, kind of started off that, but it was $15 a test. And so you start doing the math about how much that comes out to a week, but they have, you know, millions in, in um, money for uh, CARES Act that they, they applied toward that. Um, they gave testimonials today about how it worked and how it rolled out. Um, and they you know, basically, and uh, how it gave a self of kind of a, a brought confidence a lot to the, the, the school community because you're able to track on a weekly basis what kind of numbers, what's going on in your schools. So we're going to apply for that. The first six weeks are free. And here's the kicker is after six weeks, it costs money. And so and it costs $5 a head at minimum. They're saying $5 a head um, through the state bid contract. So obviously there's some you know business happening here where they're kind of allowing this kind of this rollout. I don't know what kind of um, deal that the company is giving the state, um, but then we would have to decide after that, you know, if we would continue. So I, I don't think it's a harm applying for it to start that. The rollout would happen sometime in February. There's a lot of loose ends here that I don't have the answers to. Um, you know, basically, you know, Megan and I, uh, Megan and I sat down today after the meeting. I think it was at ten. We sat down at one. So you know, I don't see a reason not to try it to see how this works and see if it can be an effective tool to just to help out. Um, well, six weeks to kind of review it. And then after that, each school will individually using the state con the state bidding contract would work with the company depending on what their needs are and how we want to do our testing. So um, so that's kind of, in a nutshell, so it's kind of exciting. Um, they're, they're expecting, again, the rollout to be the first week of February. Um, we have to get the application in by Thursday. So we're gathering the data that they get to, we have to provide the number of students in person and all that stuff. Um, the students and schools in person are a priority um, to the program, so that's positive for us. Um, and so, so yeah, and I, I mean, I'll be able to explain more as we kind of roll out the planning of it, but any kind of overall questions on how that works? I have a general knowledge of it, um, but uh, I may, may have to defer to come back to you as well. Hey, Jessica. Uh, yeah, did you say how fast the test results for the batches come back? Uh, 24 to 48 hours. Okay, and okay. maybe this isn't planned out that far yet, but will the batching, the pooling be done by cohort classroom grade, something that would allow for efficient um, quarantining when 
a batch comes back positive? That's exactly how you do it. So you 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 create they'll allow you to kind of create your your batches how you want to do it. Um, you know, I was looking at the early literature. I thought you had to do sections of twenty four because that's how much is a, the the maximum of a batch. But they really say no. You do you go to what your cohort sizes are. So if we have a I think it's very easy kind of to do cohorts more at the elementary system. You're if you have a first grade class, the entire class, including the teacher, would be one cohort, one batch testing. Um, if you have a group of people that don't fit into a group, you can put them just into one batch if you want. Um, if you had a smaller, let's say you had a, a, a class, a special education classroom that only had a half a dozen students in it, that could be one batch as well. So I don't know what the limitations are. We're, they're going to give us the details to follow as part of the, the contract. But that's how I see it, is that we would do the whole, let's say, again, the whole first grade. Um, we would send that out. If, um, if you know, Ideally, how we're envisioning it right now is we would test on Monday. We'd get the results on either Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday. And if we had a positive, um, we would have that day to kind of work and say, listen, your, your class is quarantined until we do... And so what they say is, though, after you do that testing, you then can use antigen testing. So then the school could use our antigen testing to then test, let's say, the 10 kids that are in the class. is about the, you know, our class sizes, 8 to 10, 8 to 12. Um, we could then do antigen testing of all those students at the school. because They'd have to be driven here or they wouldn't be allowed to take the bus because considered they'd be considered, um, you know, um, a positive case until we can confirm that. And they said that the antigen testing statistically will pick up. If it doesn't, then everybody's gonna have to go get a PCR individually um, um, you know, with their medical provider or be quarantined for the 14 days. So we gotta come up with the language around that, but that's kind of how it works. The nice part is the antigen testing we know in 15 minutes. So we'll be able to screen that class um, and then you know, be able to you know, give directions there. And then what do we do regarding quarantining at that point in that particular class? That'll all depend on the details of what's going on with that class, who the person is, so on and so forth. But you, you, know, you could be quarantining a class at that point. Um, it does cause, you know, superintendents were talking, it does cause things we have to figure out and complications and, and such, things we're going to have to, you know, tackle. But the positive side is that we will be able to get, if we do this weekly, there's asymptomatic cases. It's something we're not doing now. You know what I mean? And it's just going to improve overall. And I'm looking long term. So let's let's you know put on our positive hats and let's say we can get teachers vaccinated in the month of February. Right now, that's month one of the two month window um, that they're saying. Um, and I was actually talking with um, Carolyn Ness today via we'll email regarding starting to already plan the rollout of vaccination of teachers um, and getting getting our our county and stuff ready to do that, which is positive. Got to keep the positive news out there. Um, but let's say we get the teacher all vaccinated. Well, students aren't going to be vaccinated anytime soon. So we still have to be looking at our pop that population, and are we going to screen them? Is it necessary? Is it necessary to screen them? And what does that look like going through the spring? And so, um, while teachers may get vaccinated and be removed from the bat pool badging, um, we may still need to be doing that with students. And still wrapping my head around that, and you know, listening to what people are saying on that. So more to come there. But again, like I said, this is midday today um, news. Yeah, you touched upon what I was going to ask about uh, the vaccination rollout. So I know the first responders are starting now and February is going to start the phase two. Is there any indication do superintendents have, um, has there been any contact with DESI or do we know if it, it would possibly happen in the building or how, like, how would we, is there any indication of how that's going to start to progress? So I have a really terrible answer in the sense of how vague it is. So I was on a meeting with the commissioner last week. He said there's two mo modes that they're going to go to a regional testing sites and straight out of the school distribution. So if we do regional, um, you know, what that might mean, you know, they're going to give it to the positive side. If it's going to be done regionally, it's going to be done through, Carolyn Ness does run um, the group of uh, health, the, uh, the Mohawk Coalition of Health, um, for, for Franklin County. So they're gonna be doing something together. I've already reached out to her that said, we'd be more than happy to host a site and help with any coordination they need to make it possible. So, you know, depending on where, it, they're looking at the different, you know, the how people are in the, within the, you know, how communities are without throughout Massachusetts. So I don't know if they're gonna do regional sites and then we're gonna have to send teachers to that site with appointments um, and then proof of, 
you know, they're going to have to, you know, they said it's already get prepared to have proof of uh, employment. But I was, I, I was, I'm trying to push that we should do it right out of the school building. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, even if we have to do regionalize and we say everybody comes to Frontier to do it, um, you know, that way we can do a couple hundred. Um, and then they say you really should split your staff because one of the side effects is to come down with slight flu-like symptoms. And so if everybody has slight flu symptoms the following day, um, I'm also open to being creative around that. Like, you know, if we can't do it that way, then do we do a remote day the following day, just, you know, just in case. And, you know, I think, you know, moving this thing forward, um, just being creative there would be the way to do it. So, so we don't know how they're going to do it, but they're saying both models are being considered. And I mean, you know, because I imagine Franklin County, you'd have regional sites versus city schools, which have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people, if not thousands of employees, they're going to have more, um, that kind of setting. So we'll see, but yeah. Right, thanks. I'm, I'm glad, I'm just glad that the, 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 that the planning is actually starting up. Yeah, and the hope is that you probably heard that in the news that the rollout has been slower um, than they wanted, but they're expecting it to speed up. And that's, you know, that's straight out of Carolyn's uh, mouth that they're expecting to see an increase now that the systems are kind of in place. Um, even the first responders they thought was going to happen faster, they thought more was going to happen last week than was planned. Um, and so, you know, they, they were hoping to do a majority of first responders on the 8th, 9th, and 10th, or the 8th and 9th of last week. And then majority of those people got pushed this week from what I understand. <laughs> Just uh, yeah, I'm so excited to hear the vaccine news. Thank you for all of that good news. Um, I was gonna ask questions about that. Just one last question about the, the batch testing. Do we need to know anything about staffing for it? It's a lot of tests to administer in a day. Oh, good. I, I was like, st it's staffing to give the test. So the test is, is simply a nasal swab. Um, and so the schools that gave presentations said they explained the different ways they did it. Some do it during the mass breaks when the students are um, are outside or in transit. Some do it during like lunch when then they have students come up one at a time until the whole lunchroom is done and they kind of do it that way. There's another one's a nurse cart that goes to the outside the hallway and one by one the students come out and you know the swab is done. Another school with the older students they were doing the high school. They would bring it in the classroom and everybody would do it at once, whatever. Um, you can do practice ones with students with, you know, a, a concern came from CPAC to us regarding what about students with disabilities and, and how you can do practice one with Q-tips and kind of run, you know, kids through it and what it's going to like. We probably can even do it for nervous younger students about what this is going to be like. And we could all, I don't know if that's a good idea, Ben, I'll, I'll run that by you. <laughs> they could all give, give it. A, um, but anyway, we, you know, there's different kind of things about how that runs, but there's different models in which we're going to do it. And I think based on our building size, it's going to be building-based decision and how we roll that out and, 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 and comfort level of how that's going to be. Do we need more staffing? I don't think so. Um, they said it takes five minutes a class. You're doing it once a week. You know what I mean? So you, you, lock, you mark off an hour during the day. We get the school nurse and maybe um, an assistant to go with to help out with anything there and just go classroom to classroom or during breaks or however they see fit. Um, the one thing we do have to figure out is that we do have to courier the testing to we don't know where. Um, and so we may be, um, as a district, coming together to be um, either finding volunteers who want to do the couriering route once a week or paying somebody to do the couriering route. Um, I'm imagining, we asked, we asked in the chat, because you can put questions on, is there a Western Mass, you know, um, you know, the depository for it? And they didn't answer. So which means there isn't. Um, so, you know, I wonder if there will be, or maybe there's a one collection site that from Western Mass then gets driven east, I don't know. Um, or somebody's gonna be driving to Worcester, I imagine is probably where one of those places is gonna be. So details, but all hurdles, I think we can, we can, we can overdo. Um, anyone else? Outstanding, thank you. All right, so on to the budget proposal, 2022. Okay, so I did email you an update, a big change from yesterday to today, which we'll talk about. I'm gonna sort of go in the sequence that I have in the narrative just so we can um, follow. Darius, do you wanna share or? Okay, he's gonna share a screen so that everyone can see the update. 
Um, so while he's getting that ready, I'll start this by saying we have no state data yet. Cherry sheets are not out. There's you know, really no information at this point. Um, so what we really did to start was a level service approach to building this budget. Um, we kept existing staff programs and services in place based on the FY21 budget. Um, we considered um, the adjustments in contracts for uh, cost of living raises and then step increases. I also considered um, any column movement. If somebody had gone back to school and earned another part of the degree and was changing to a different column in the contract, um, that's captured here. Uh, we also included uh, increase in wages for non-union staff. That would be central office, cafeteria, uh, custodians, et cetera. Um, and then I reviewed our non-salary accounts just to make sure that we were adjusting based on actual data from the current year and from prior year spending. So there were some, you know, few little bit of changes there. I made note of the couple that were most significant, but otherwise if it was, you know, really, you know, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, something like that, I really didn't make um, a notation on here because it doesn't add up to a lot. Um, and then the other thing I took into consideration is looking at insurance and retirement related expenses, which are primarily central office related. So Sunderland's portion of those types of expenses, I built in a three and a half percent increase because we just never know what's going to happen with insurance. We don't have our rates or anything like that out yet, but it's better to be prepared. Um, and then the last step of this process was to look at all of those revolving accounts that we just talked about from fiscal year 21, where I think that the projections are gonna be at the end of the year and looking at what the expenses have been and whether or not we could continue with those expenses on the revolving accounts. Um, so Darius, you can scroll down a little bit. Um, so after taking all of that into consideration, uh, we are looking at a steep increase right now uh, for next year of 8.98%. Um, I know Darius will jump in here and, and reiterate what I'm about to say, but you know this is our first draft and we really wanted to look at the numbers in almost a worst case scenario and we know that we have work to do and that this is not an acceptable number, um, but it felt like the most transparent approach to you all and to our community to show what the real impact is after considering all of the things that I talked about above. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the significant factors. Um, the first is the early childhood program. Uh, so we typically have about 55,000 that is paid in wages off of the early childhood revolving fund. Um, we're looking at a carryover of around 20,000 from this year to next year. Um, but our staffing is not going to change. So in order to make sure that we're covering all of our um, staffing needs, I moved $45,000 in wages over to the general fund, leaving only $10,000 in expenditures on the early childhood revolving account. Now, this could change a lot between now and when the budget is approved, and it could change again between the budget is approved and September. We have no guidance at this point that I'm aware of from DESE on what class sizes can look like next year, what spacing requirements might be, um, kids getting vaccinated, all of these pieces that we've been talking about. So, you know, worst case scenario, we move ahead with a year like we're in right now, and we have very little revenue because our class sizes are small, um, and we really are only meeting, for the most part, um, it's largely our uh, special needs population with a, a smaller group of um, typically developing children paying tuition in there. Um, so if that's the case, then we would probably be looking at revenue of only maybe 10 to 12,000 next year. Even if we can increase our class sizes, I don't expect we're going to go back to revenue where we were going into 2020 or 2019. Um, we may have families that choose not to send their children to preschool. We may have families that choose to homeschool for preschool. Um, and again, the, the classroom capacity is a big concern. So even if we are bringing in some revenue, I still don't expect that it's automatically going to jump up from the 10,000 we're looking at this year to 55,000 to be able to cover wages. So it feels most fiscally responsible to consider paying those wages from another funding source. Um, so that is an early childhood update. And if we scroll down, 
Um, sort of the same theme here with the school lunch wages, um, making sure that we have enough to pay our staff. Um, we're pretty much depleting all of our savings this year, if not having to supplement from another source in 21. Um, and again, similar theme. We don't know what school lunch looks like. We do not know if the USDA is going to extend this free lunch waiver for all students. Um, and we also do not anticipate numbers to automatically jump back up to where they were um, in prior years. So we know we're still going to have the same staffing needs, however, because that piece is not going to change um, moving forward. Uh, we're still going to be serving lunches five days a week. So we moved 44000 in school lunch wages to the general fund. Um, again, we can make uh, considerations to move things around later, but that's what we're looking at right now. Let me scroll down, Darius. Um, so the third significant budget increase is the addition of a sixth grade teacher. I believe Ben has been prompting us for some time on this, that the sixth grade class next year, the cohort is much larger, and we will uh, likely need to split into two classes. Um, so that's an addition to the budget for next year. That is the only new position at this point that's in there. Um, and then the final piece, and this is what really made the shift, if you're wondering where that shift came from, from yesterday's reports to today's reports. Um, Darius, Ben, Karen, and I had met before we started building the budget. We have been aware of this out-of-district placement. It actually comes into play this year. However, we have been able to figure out how to use special education grant funding to cover the cost this year. But moving into next year, those grant funds will likely not be available. Um, so we do need to get that on general budget. The other big change here was that the cost that we thought the program that the child was going to go into was only going to be around 30000 and that is not the case. Um, that program is, will not work out, so we are going to see an increase of 80000 instead of $30,000. Um, it is only, Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, a one-year um, cost at this point because there's no other children in the pipeline for out-of-district placement, and this will be a sixth grader um, next year. So uh, that is a significant increase. A couple of minor increases here just to make sure that you know um, some changes that we made. So $2,500 in building maintenance. Um, it, it's it reflecting our spending from prior years, but I don't have to tell you all or the town that, you know, Sunderland's building needs just keep growing year after year. So I think it makes sense to increase this. It's a small amount. It's really not going to have a huge impact. Um, but one of the things that I think it's going to help us with is immediately freeing up $2,500 that we use to pay from the existing budget for the Siemens contract for the energy management system. Um, that's going to automatically put $2,500 actually into repairs instead of paying for this large contract just for a vendor um, to come in. And, you know, one of the things for us to consider, and I have asked our facilities director, Bill Hildreth, to look into this is how long that contract goes for with them. And at that point, um, maybe either considering another resource or even dropping that contract and just paying for repairs as needed because we may not be seeing the benefit. Um, I think we pay around 7000 a year for that fee. So um, more to come, but definitely something on our radar. Um, and then special education transportation. This may fluctuate. I'm waiting for some more information from the uh, SPED department on this, but this year we had 7,700 of special education transportation on school choice because we didn't budget properly for it. The numbers, once we were finally back to school after budget was approved, um, came in higher. So I've asked Karen and her team to look at these numbers closely. Um, and obviously we base them on this year's enrollment and you know if we know of anyone coming in, but I do think it's good to get transportation back into the general fund instead of having it split. Um, we could make a decision to keep that 7,700 on school choice, um, but again, wanted you to see what that looks like. Um, I know it's a lot of information and, and I can stop if you want me to stop or I'll keep going. If anyone has a question about that, I'll, otherwise I'll keep moving along. Um, so the other thing that I looked at is the cost share percentage for central office, Sunderland's cost share percentage, and Sunderland's share is actually going down. Um, so these are primarily central office related expenditures, but they also pertain to things like um, the elementary curriculum director or the early childhood director who's split amongst all four of the elementary schools. 
Um, so Sunderland's share is going down pretty significantly next year. Um, when things are split five ways and Frontier is included, say for instance, the superintendent's salary or my salary, um, we've decreased 1.33% in Sunderland on the cost share. And then things when, when they're four ways, just in the elementary schools, it's almost a percentage there. So that's saving us um, a significant amount of money. I believe it's almost $17,000 in the cost share contribution. Um, and then I also looked at personnel changes. So we know we had a mid-year retirement. Um, and then I believe that there was a change in one other staff member. And so we're seeing with the anticipated uh, or already hired new staff um, that are coming in, if one of them came in this year, I believe, or maybe they both came in this year, we're looking at a $42,000 savings in personnel because of the step and column that those new hires came in at. So that's good news for us. Otherwise, we'd be looking at about another 2% higher if we weren't able to capture the, those um, changes. Um, so to wrap up that discussion, and then we can talk about revolving funds and balances if we need to, um, but the 8.98% increase, I did want to point out that roughly 3% of that is attributed to the COVID hardship with the early childhood program and then the school lunch program. That's a significant number. You know, if we didn't have all of these, you know, trickle down effects happening that started last year into this year, and we're seeing it again in another year, you know, we'd be pulling that 3% right off the budget because we haven't added staffing. We haven't added any programs. Um, it's really just because those revolving funds are depleted and now we have to supplement. Um, so then we have another 3% that's related to that out of district tuition. Um, that really should be a one year cost unless something comes up in the future. Um, but if we're looking at an 8.98% increase and we back out that 6%, we're really looking at an entirely different budget um, with a, a number that is actually probably easy for most of us to hold on to to start with and then knowing that we would have some work to do. Um, so Darius, Ben and I spoke today and you know, after a, a long, serious conversation, um, we do think that it is best to freeze this year's budget immediately so that we can capture savings in support of next year. Um, last year, we, we did the same process when COVID hit. We stopped spending, um, really only purchased what was necessary, and it allowed us to keep existing staffing in place. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that we won't have to continue to talk about how to bring this number down, but if we can come up with 30,000 savings this year that we can put back into school choice, it's just going to further support us in the future. Um, I don't think that this is the end of some hard discussions and some tough decision making, but it's certainly the start in this process. And, you know, our budget season is likely going to be elongated. Um, the town I know is talking about bumping um, town meeting date at some point, even though they are using the same timeline right now for budget planning. But this is going to be a long process and we're going to have to be patient and move slowly through it. Um, but right now, that is our recommendation given the projected number for next year. Woo! <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> what questions do you have? And we can certainly keep going here. I gave you um, revolving fund updates. Uh, just so that you would know what I was thinking about for the end of next year. So you can see here for school choice, um, we're looking at starting the year just shy of 240, ending the year at 175 next year. Um, you know, we're obviously overspending our revenue uh, and the, any staffing that was paid there, wage increases are taken into consideration. 175 is still a healthy number. Um, but if we do have to try to bring down that 8.98 with more school choice funds, obviously that lowers our balance at the end of next year. Um, keep going. So early childhood, the revenue is unknown, but right now we have 10,000 in expenses on that account. So um, if we had no revenue coming in, end of year next year would be just over 10,000. And um, special education revolving, we're nearly covering our expenses here with the tuition that we're bringing in. Um, they are slightly higher based on uh, primarily wage increases. Um, so we'd be looking at end of next year and that revolving account just over 10,000 there as well. And I didn't include any numbers on school lunch because we're pretty much starting school lunch at zero. We have no idea what we're gonna have for revenue. 
Um, and my recommendation is to move our expenses off of it. So if we do bring in revenue, it would really be to build that account up again so that we're in a more healthy position. It wouldn't necessarily be to cover salaries and wages or um, cost of goods sold. So um, more to talk about there as well. I know it's a lot of information um, and I think in February, you know, we'll definitely have um, more of a proposal for you on how we can creatively move some of those things around. Um, but I know Darius and I would like to move ahead with um, the budget freeze for 21. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what could fall out of the sky and help us? Um, so it's, it's, which is not really, um, not wishing on a star really, is that we could see another uh, round of funding regarding COVID. And if they allow us to use the COVID money to apply to those two revolving funds that, are, that got crushed by COVID, um, that might be something that could help us. Um, and again, that's a 3%. We're talking about a percentage point is just under 30,000. Just say 30,000, it's, it's 29 and change. So when you're looking at percentage points and, and number values, it, it helps me a lot when I start to figure out how we get certain places. Um, but yeah, I think, they, so there are some things that we might be able to do that. You know, we might be able to, um, again, these are ideas for even, um, you know, just to start, start mulling over that we'll try to play with. There might be one-time expenses that we could ask the town to pick up and not increase the overall budget, which is, you know, helps long-term, but builds us out of a year that's, you know, unprecedented um, in the services that we provided in a time that um, has been so difficult. Um, you know, that, those might be some other options that we can do to, to kind of move that needle down. Um, the, the, the budget freeze, you know, um, that we're looking for to starting tonight, you know, we can do it, you know, at the discretion of the principal. So if things have to get done, you know, you know, you know, minor things and that kind of thing, you know, uh, I'd like to leave it that way. That way we can, um, you know, move things forward if that's moved forward and it's not, um, it just means we're tightening up until we can figure out, um, what we have to do this year, um, to help with next year. Uh, I'm just going to say, um, again, kudos to the, the team. Uh, taking care of special head as a priority is, is not just, uh, it, it is the right thing to do. And it's also, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of out of district placement. So this is uh, the argument for why we've been doing this stuff all along. Um, and then and every now and then you, you have to do what you have to do. Uh, Certainly, it seems reasonable to freeze the budget at this point, and uh, I, I think what you're doing is responsible. Uh, I also have a sense that uh, you guys are planning around sort of worst case, and uh, hopefully, it's not going to be that bad. But uh, probably, this is this is the responsible position going in. So, uh, yeah, uh, how you're doing it. I did reach. I reached out to Jeff, um, the town administrator, and we had a conversation because I wanted to know. Other towns have already moved their um, town meeting date to June and kind of just basically said where we're going to do a whole different kind of approach, different approach in the sense of the timeline. Um, the longer we can wait, the more information we get. You know, what I mean, if we, you know, the information we're going to have in April, May versus how the vaccination rolled out, what's the expectation of September? Um, right now, we don't even know what kindergarten registration looks like. The longer we have, We'll have better ideas of numbers and that kind of stuff, and that'll help us in the budget process as well. So I did I let him know that that even if we you know are to show up and right now we're looking at the second school committee uh, the second select board meeting in February to present. Frontier won't have a budget. I can tell you that right now. If the state doesn't have a budget, Frontier won't have a budget because we don't know the assessments. And so if we can't we don't know the assessments, we can't build a budget and give it to the town or or know what our expenses are. They're going to be in the same kind of position we are on this day where we know what our expenses are right now, but we don't know how we're going to fund it. And so, you know, that date right now might be the first conversation day. I said, Jeff, we can keep it on the books and we can talk about what we're looking at here and maybe they have creative ideas. But I really think a, a transparent process on such a unique year. And Greg Jessica has her hand up, I think. Well, Jessica. I, I had a question about the, the sixth grade teacher in the budget. Do we have a classroom for them that doesn't have any budget implications? Ken? 
So um, just to clarify, we have a one sixth grade class leaving and potentially two kindergarten classes coming in. And that's where the extra teacher would be coming in. Um, no, it's something else, something we would have to build at the uh, a plan at the at the building level. Um, so we'd form a team in house and look at space. Um, that's if there is no other no other options. And that's really going to be the importance we were talking about. What is the enrollment coming in for preschool in, in K for next year? Um, and if all those are at max, Jessica, the question you're going to follow up is, then what do we do? Um, and it's going to it's going to get tight. I don't think we we certainly can't build an addition right now. Um, you know, mobile classroom, that kind of stuff. I mean, we can look at what what those you know, mobile units or that kind of thing. Um, again, huge expense. Um, and what does that look like? So, uh, and we don't have it what the numbers are. You know, right now our, our student population is is less than we were at this point last year um, by quite a by quite a bit by almost forty students. But how many of them are going to be coming back? Our overall district wide, we had some families that chose to homeschool rather than um, do the remote plan. Um, and I think with their with the kind of the indication that they're going to come back when things become normal again. And if September is normal. Um, Will they be coming back? And the same with some of the school choice families. Uh, there's a few, a couple of school choice families in that same kind of, um, in the same kind of ballpark. So, again, we, we don't have those hard numbers yet. Um, so, if I could, uh, I'm looking quickly at Peter's email because I wanted to make sure that I addressed everything. Um, and that funding, Peter, that Darius was talking about, is that additional stimulus package. So they're saying right now that that would be based on. Um, your Title I status, which Sunderland does not receive Title I funding. Um, we did get $20,000 in the ESSER grant already this year, which was based on the same structure. I'm hearing that even the districts with minimum um, aid for the ESSER grant are supposed to get more with the second stimulus package, but you know, obviously we don't know that yet. So as Darius said, that could be helpful. Um, and then you had that question about the enrollment sheet. So Ben and I did talk about that today and we did correct that. That's just an error on the report. So we made sure that that's all set. And then the only other thing pertaining to 22 is you asked about the retirement payouts and you're absolutely right. Um, we are looking at having some retirement payouts next year. Uh, I am still working with my staff on those calculations. They're not in this budget currently. Um, it is more than one staff member. We did have, um, somebody leave mid-year this year, and then I think last year we had at the end of the year, but they gave us notice too late for it to get into 21 budget. Um, so, you know, that could be $30,000 if we're talking about three folks and, you know, depending on what their buyouts are. So um, that's not in this budget yet, but is something that we will have to continue to discuss. And I know last time there were um, retirement payouts, we asked for special town warrant. So, you know, I don't know if that'll be something that we have to reconsider going to the town for, um, or if we use school choice funds, since that is truly a, you know, one time this year specific request, um, you know, or how we creatively cover the rest of that so more, more on didn't, that yeah uh, didn't they say some of that that federal that that stimulus money that was going to go to the towns as well so while we may not be looking at it it will be like for like the cares act and the cares act was extended and i don't know if sunderland um used up all their money uh, most of the other towns i mean conway didn't use they're like we got plenty of it they were saying phil was saying that that the frontier meeting the night. How much do you guys need? We got. To, we want to spend it instead of giving it back. I know Deerfield got it down to within five thousand dollars. They were trying to use as much as they could. Um, I don't know where Sunderland is on that. If they have extra money in that, and if they don't know how to spend it, we could be applying so instead of giving it back. Is what I'm trying to say. Is if you don't use it, you give it back. You know, if it, that might be another avenue. I know they don't. The select board doesn't want me going spending their funds, but I'm just trying to look for a different, it's a town problem. So um, we'll be coming to them. Yeah, so I have had a conversation with Jeff recently, um, actually because Sunderland Elementary uh, for the UV light install, they were covering that with the MIAA grant that they applied for for us. Um, but Sunderland was the only school, it's always Sunderland, <laughs> that had this extra component of the project that none of the other schools had. And there was an electrical charge from the electrician 
Um, so I, I had asked Jeff if we could throw that either on CARES or if he could add it to MIAA. And he said right now they have all of their CARES Act allocated. And I believe he had sent around a note saying that CARES spending really was on freeze right now. Um, but I don't know if that's just because they're trying to finish up the reporting from the first piece and see if they can get more money. Um, I'm happy to follow up with him. The other thing is uh, in regards to the first comment you made, I haven't heard yet about towns receiving additional funding, but you know who knows, that certainly could be coming as well. Sorry, that's not probably good news for us. And, they, and I was just saying from the state level, they don't know because they're waiting for the transition of power at the federal level to find out what the federal is going to do for stimulus packages to the states and then the states, how they distribute it. So just letting people know that's kind of the process. And that's why the state hasn't worked on the twenty um, the 22 budget yet, because they're waiting to see what the federal government is going to give the state for money so they can. There are, everybody's waiting for the starting point. And I think the starting point starts in the, uh, the federal level. I can't hear you, Peter. Hey, Peter, yeah, we can't hear you. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. This happens in like half of my classes. <laughs> Um, can I ask a quick question? I think it's going to take a, a, a different, um, just different angle. Just thinking about next year. Um, one concern I did have was the amount of students that we would come back. We're going to let's see if this mic works. Am I here? Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that that I think that the overall um, budget process is, while it's you know, it may be difficult, it may be, you know, hard decisions, it may be things that the selectmen would rather not have to deal with when it comes to the school budget and so on. I think the fact that um, the way we are, what shall I say, doing business um, is going to help all of that, meaning that, you know, Shelly, you're talking to Jeff regularly, Darius is talking to them, uh, we're showing up at selectmen meetings, there's open transparency about what's going on in our budget. The all the special funds, the numbers of them are laid out, you know, right there for everybody to see. I think this is all absolutely what we should be doing. And I think it's really going to help as we go down the road. Um, and the only other thing I would add is that, you know, as much bad news as you could say that there is in the school budget, if I look at the overall town picture, um, I don't think the overall town picture is, you know, got a lot of bad things to add on um there will be significant more revenue this year from the completion of the new apartment complex um you know i don't know how the school i mean we don't know what the state's going to do i mean the town hasn't you know it didn't file it's closed its financial books until december for last year so they won't know what they got for free cash for another three months um it's going to take a while but you know i think we're doing things I'm pleased with how you guys are doing things. I think it's great. And I think that, you know, we got to, who knows, but it's a way lot better than if we were just trying to cover this stuff up. You can't do it that way. And, and I think you're doing it absolutely right. I wish the, I wish the problem was simpler to solve, but I think we're taking the best approach we can. Uh, Keith, thank you, Peter. Keith, you want to finish up your question? Yeah, I don't actually expect an answer on this one. It's just throwing something out there. And it's something that um, some colleagues of mine have been talking about. So I don't know how many students might come back with, you know, Darius mentioned some homeschool people chosen to, to homeschool their students that they might stay that way. I don't. So I'm thinking, are we going to return to the standard model or, or, or would we foresee maybe changing the delivery in some way, shape or form? Or would we look at maybe like start time? Would we look at class time? Would we look at the possibility of having to have some sort of remote services for students that choose to stay that way. Are we, you know, are we going to go back to exactly what it was like 2018? Or are we going to um, plan on trying to do something different? I think it's a good question um, in the sense that what are we going to take on the positive end? What are we going to take the positive things of this experience? And are we going to try to incorporate that in um, 
that we haven't made any, we haven't, haven't really thought that through, especially, you know, uh, I'm gonna say, especially at the elementary level, you know, we talked about, you know, um, you know, kind of just around the table conversations at the secondary level, because where you could have some remote classes and also teach kids how to take remote classes, since that's going to be the future of colleges, probably to some degree. Um, but going um, what the state is going to require us to do, you know, the dual model is extremely expensive, you know, and so, you know, and um, I, I'm going to doubt that the state is going to require schools to provide a dual model. Right, they're going to say if you want to, if we still have the, if the virus is still around, let's say for those who cannot be vaccinated, let's say they're saying children can't be vaccinated, families feel that way, maybe they're going to allow families to do, on, enter the virtual academies or that kind of stuff, and not in that in that regard. And I don't know how and that could actually hurt us financially as well, depending on how they they, they structure the finances of that. Um, but whether or not they're going to require us to, I doubt at this point in time they're going to require us to have dual models offered. Um, and then hearing, I don't know, that's one of those things where we don't know, you know, we don't know what the climate's going to be like. Is every, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be the summer of love and everything comes back and everybody's going a hundred percent forward, or is it um, going to still be, you know, other strains and, you know, this kind of thing. And I don't know. Okay. So I like, I did, I didn't expect to have any uh, any idea, and I know that like even just playing the budget and then trying to throw like additional planning on top is really difficult. But I was just looking at like a crisis is opportunity kind of kind of an idea going forward, and and then like you said, what do we take away from this, and what can we implement going forward? Just something to think about. Yeah, <laughs> we're still kind of in crisis mode. I know we kind of we shut that off tonight a little bit, but we we still are in the middle of the bad part of the pandemic. So I hear you. I wish I could just take a group of educators and say, forget all your worries and go in the room and come up with how we can change things. And, and that's going to be the hard part. Um, even this summer, as we look ahead and the administration's already planning it, but we're going to be, we're going to be open for a lot of the summer because if we can have students back in person, we're going to have compensatory services to deliver and not just, not just compensatory services within grids, but we're also going to need just the average student that's going to need extra catch up and um, in summer programming and that kind of stuff. And on top of that, people are going to need a break. You know what I mean? Like we can't, we've already talked about professional development and we can't have a, year, a summer of pounding professional development on teachers as well, because they're going to need just a kind of, it's been a long year for them as well, as, as well as, you know, needing some of them to do summer services. And it's, it's you know, there's a lot of the program in there. So I'm actually fearful that we don't get to take advantage of sitting down and really coming up with that. So I'm going to try, Keith, I'm going to try, but I'm just telling you with all the things that are on the table. Anyone else? Anything else? Budget? No. Um, um, and then I'll, I'll just agree pretty much with, with what uh, Peter said. And, uh, and again, I, I like the emphasis uh, going forward, talking with the town about uh, um, we don't want to drag our feet at the same time. The longer you can delay, the more clarity you get. So if, if you want your best chance at good looking numbers without uh, us having to do anything reactionary that we have to walk back, then uh, then we'll be as communicative as we can, as early as we can. But uh, uh, I get the message loud and clear that the more time you have to figure out how some of the stuff settles out, the better we'll be able to tell them what we, we can and can't do for the budget. All right. I saw, uh, if, oh, go ahead, Peter. Peter, I can't hear you again. Can you hear you? But this time is the it's the mute button we see, so it's not your computer. Maybe okay, start again. Am I okay? All right. Um, even if we got to walk something back, okay. If they've been in the loop since the beginning, okay, then it's not a problem because you know, assuming we got a good reason to walk it back, you know, what's the big deal? You know, they want us to be as smart as we can, and smart as you being smart as you can sometimes mean you take new information and you change what you're doing. Okay. Likewise, if we go there and you know mid late. February and present a budget. 
I don't think anybody's going to say, okay, at this point from here on out, you can't change anything. You know, you keep coming up with new information. You keep uh, figuring out uh, different solutions. You know, we may be changing things for a long time, but that's good management. That's not, you know, that's not bad management. As long as, again, we let people know what we're doing. So I think the approach here is great. I don't like the numbers there, but, you know, there's stuff. There may be a case with the out-of-district stuff that we can certainly have the conversation with the town. That shouldn't be in the budget because, see, what they're scared about, because they still, you know, they got a real mistrust built over, built up over decades of other administrations, not our current one, that would say, ah, you know, they put the money in for this out-of-district placement, and then it never comes out. Okay, it gets shifted over to other stuff and we lose track of it and, and you look around and geez, the budget just keeps growing. So, you know, there's sort of that's why we can we sold last year the thing about the retirement uh, uh, one time payment going on a special article, because that way they could be sure it didn't get built into the budget. OK, now we can do that again. We can propose that again and we can propose again for this thing with the outer district payment. You know, I mean, you know, at least get them in on the decision and then we've got. You know, we got all here walk, working towards the same end. You know, it's worth trying. If if no one else uh, has anything else, so uh, I take a motion to adjourn. Um, were there any reports we had to hear? Oh, fair enough. I'm sorry. I missed the whole page. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted clarity for myself that we are moving. You all are okay with Darius, Ben, and I moving forward with a budget freeze for FY21 with discretion of principal facilities, et cetera, on how you know emergency spending needs to happen. There's no objections to that. Okay, I just want to make sure I have clarity on that. Thank you. All right. Ben, do you, do you have a report you want to do? Yeah, I just uh, one one brief thing. You know, when school transitioned to remote learning in December, we were able to continue some in-person services for approximately ten students. We had staff, uh, the staff that was supporting these students, volunteered for the opportunity. Um, so we're really appreciative of their efforts. Additionally, I'd like to thank the entire SES teaching team for their continued efforts in providing the optimal learning experiences for our students. The time, energy. Um, that they've been putting in while juggling so many different demands is very commendable. So every day I'm I'm thankful. Uh, each day when I go to work to uh, work with my colleagues. And that's it. Tim. Good deal. Any questions for Ben? Just a lot of gratitude to all of the staff members, those who volunteered to come in and everybody else who who transitioned quickly when when things changed and didn't they didn't know what they were planning for it's it's a lot of stress and everything that i've seen from my kids classrooms has really been outstanding and i'm just very appreciative to the entire staff absolutely and i would echo what jessica's saying i remind my kids every day what they're doing is extraordinary what the teachers are doing is extraordinary what the administration is doing is extraordinary that nobody's ever done this before nobody's ever tried this before even just the the simple act of going in and trying to continue their education, a mundane act is extraordinary in these times. So I have to remind them all the time. I try to remind myself and, and I would echo that for all the teachers as well. All right, uh, Darius, do you have a superintendent report in addition to- Yeah, I just got a, a few updates um, as well. Um, I do want to welcome aboard uh, Jeffrey McDonald who's taking over as our new food, food service director. Um, Jeffrey comes from us from the UMass Food Service, um, UMass Amherst uh, Food Service Program. Um, and he began work just before the holiday break and he had some carryover days with, um, with Mary DeLuza, but we wish uh, Mary and her family well. They've gone and um, she will be missed, but we are excited to have Jeffrey aboard who's kind of hit the ground running. And so it becomes an opportunity, maybe I'll get him into one of our meetings here so you guys can lay eyes on him. Um, the next real thing quickly is the uh, last week the MCAS, uh, the state came out that the MCAS testing will um, take place grades three through eight this spring. However, it will be through a sampling, smaller session sampling approach 
where each student will take portions of each MCAS assessment on each subject. Um, they want to have, um, still have validity and reliability of the test at the, you know, at the school level. However, they're not going to um, hold schools accountable to any testing data. They just wanna be able to track what's happened this year. Um, this has been kind of reached, has reached people on multiple, uh, there's multiple opinions on this, um, whether or not we should be wasting our time with testing. And then there's those who feel like that we having some data points about where students are so that um, we can have a snapshot of where things are at, you know, after this, this COVID, I wouldn't call it experiment because we didn't really volunteer for it, um, but this COVID crisis, um, you know, where people are at. So um, they are moving that forward there. Um, I'm not really worried about it as a district. Um, I think, you know, comparatively speaking to other districts across the state, um, you know, we pretty, we've had an excellent program. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, I don't think people should be worried about it. I think it's just a good, I personally would like to see data uh, myself as a district to see how we're, how we're moving, you know, and where we need to make up if there's, if there's, if there's lapses, you know, um, and it's, it's one test, it's one, it's one snapshot. Um, and it should be taken that way as well. Um, and, and I'll continue to say that it's only one tool we use. So um, there's that, that, and, um, oh, I just have one little, I brought up the pool testing before, and my last thing was just a reminder, and I'm kind of saying this to all school committees, that um, uh, reminding about confidentiality, especially when we're dealing with COVID cases and staff members and that kind of stuff with COVID cases, sometimes school committee members may, get privy to information or maybe be in a line of information where they are given information, um, you need to be careful that you're not sharing any information regarding staff members or students on social medias or any of that kind of thing um, that would indicate who people are and that kind of thing. And, and I, just a reminder across the board, um, is we haven't had any problems in our district. There's been some problems in other districts where things accidentally happen on or I thought that was common knowledge was said, just remember your roles that you're really not allowed to um, give that information, even if you believe it to be common knowledge. So just a reminder um, to everybody on that kind of thing. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call and I can let you know what people should know or not know legally. That's it. Thank you. Sorry to end on that. I don't know. Uh, Greg? Greg, just a, yeah. a can you hear me? Yeah. Um, there will be a meeting of the Capital Planning Committee tomorrow evening. That's the first meeting of this budget cycle. Um, so I'm actually a member of it now, so I'll go. Keith said he might stop in too. It's, I think it's, I don't think we're getting to review of actual projects, just looking at the big, bigger picture and so on. But again, I'll report back uh, regularly in terms of what gets done there. And, and Darius, Ben, at some point, there'll be a meeting where I'll be wanting some support from administration in terms of talking about the actual projects on our list. I imagine that'd be the next meeting. Absolutely, Peter, just let me know. Okay. And is anyone working with the collaborative? That's me, we haven't had a meeting in a while. Good deal. Other than the um, bill deal is retired and, and they're replacing him. Um, I did wanna check though, uh, there's, it, just double check, there is a, a board of health meeting tomorrow night, is that correct? Yes, the board, there's a board of health and school committee. So there's a regular board of health meeting, which the Frontier School Committee is joining because they're gonna have a discussion about athletics um, and spectator and competition is the question that the, the board of health is gonna make a decision on. So um, like we said, any moving forward, any um, board of health means that's involving a school, we invite that we're gonna try to do a joint meeting. So uh, that's you, Keith. So you have a Frontier meeting tomorrow night and that's, Yes, you know. So, okay. All right. Maybe now I'm not jumping the gun if I take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Second. All right. Who said uh, Jessica? Jessica. Yep. Thank Jessica. You. Yes. Peter. Yes. Keith. Yes. Maisie? Yes. Greg, yes. Thank you all so much.